Hello everyone and, and welcome to this session. I'm going to point some technical things uh, explain to you a little bit before I start that I'm very much in communication with you very much and don't have all the most of the advantages that you might have in the one of the things I've learned along the way about um, how how this how my work has evolved uh, as I as I've gone through uh, teaching and learning. So uh, the session is called a pedagogy of power, um, and it's in direct response to. Uh, a, a, an article by Martin Haberman. And Martin Haberman's an American educationalist who wrote an article about the pedagogy of poverty some time ago. And effectively, what he was doing was he was looking at the educational diet that children got in the Rust Belt of the United States when they their teachers were put under high accountability, high surveillance systems. And when that happened, what they found was that teachers defaulted to what he called this pedagogy of poverty and the pedagogy of poverty I think can be summed up quite well in this image we see here before us uh, this is an image of children in the UK in the 1920s learning to swim believe it or not uh, and I don't think any of us would look at this image now and not think <laughs> that perhaps um, it's a ridiculous way to teach children to learn how to swim but it's a classic example of the kind of pedagogical poverty and impoverished pedagogical thinking that sometimes teachers will apply to a curriculum that has become too constrained and that has detached them, if you like, from the sense making of understanding the process of education from the perspective and point of view of children. So what I want to do as I go through the next 40 minutes or so is to just try and unpick that a little bit and think about what the school system's getting wrong and also perhaps what it might be starting to get right and, and where we might sit, whether we are teachers or youth workers or other caregivers um, for young people in how that manifests itself in perhaps some of the behaviours and some of the circumstances that children find themselves in. So one of the difficulties we have in education at the moment, and perhaps we might argue in a wider society, uh, societal way, is a process of alienation from um, a sense of purpose in education. Children will often say to their teachers, I don't see the point in this, I don't know why I'm doing this, I'll never need it in the real world. But also, even perhaps more worryingly, that children feel they're disconnected from the possibilities that the world has to offer them. And too often, education is dangled in front of, a child, in front of young people as a future-orientated carrot. And that future-orientated carrot is held there <laughs> and their progress is kind of whipped up by the sticks at the back of them pushing them towards it and the reality is as you all know children are not future orientated they tend to live very much in the present and so what I want to talk about is how we can make the present of the curriculum a, a, a kind of experience that children engage with in the here and now but still build the competencies, the attitudes, the capabilities, the confidence that they need to see possibilities in the future. So we, I'm going to unpick this a little bit more and think about why we might do this and perhaps some of the research that has informed my thinking. Um, and I, I came across a book, I'd, I'd had a lot of thoughts around this, but I came across a book that you're probably all familiar with, um, Drive by Daniel Pink, you know, about a decade, just over a decade ago, and read it. And for me, lots of pennies started to drop in my mind um, about human motivation and what motivates people. And what Pink writes about, and effectively what his book is about, is a collation of evidence. And what he writes about is the idea that the evidence seems to point very firmly in the direction that people are motivated by a sense of purpose, by having the time to become masters at their craft or their purpose or their job or whatever it is and in schools we might think of that as our subject 
and then to have the autonomy and trust to be able to explore both that purpose and that mastery in a way that gives them a sense of meaning. And it felt to me that when I read that, um, a lot of things that I'd been thinking about as a teacher and around the relationships that I had with children in class, and certainly around the planning I did around curriculum, started to make more sense. Because for me, um, teaching and learning, good teaching and learning had all three of these things at their heart. And also, um, you know, good leadership and management at a school level should have had these things at their heart and that's not how uh, teachers experience the education system so I am going to talk about children but I'm also going to talk about teachers. There's also another interesting uh, chapter in a book published by the OECD about good teaching and learning um, and Burkhart's chapter also points us to the idea that in order to effectively learn children need to be interested they need to be emotionally invested in what they're doing um, but they, these ideas of purpose mastery and autonomy also sit very firmly in that chapter as well so that's kind of driving a lot of what I'm thinking. And then there's the kind of battle that many people are fighting in education at the moment. And for me, that, manif that battle manifests itself beautifully in these words, uh, which were actually a review of my book uh, in the Times Educational Supplement, where the reviewer had taken a whole chapter I'd written with my good friend, Hal Roberts, um, about what we could learn from forests in the, in the curriculum and how, how the, the idea of a forest could cross over many subjects. And of course, part of that was arguing that children should encounter being in forests. Uh, and the reviewer said, what's the point in frolicking in those forests if you can't spell forest? And that, colleagues, sums up pretty much everything that's wrong with education at the moment, because we really literally cannot see the wood for the trees. So in response to that, one of the things I wanted to kind of get teachers thinking about a little bit more and, and other people thinking about more is that if you are driven, if, if you're an educationalist and you are driven by test results and exams and you've lost the sense of experience, then why would you push children through stress? Because that in itself is counterproductive. We know that um, stress hormones, cortisol, impact on children's brains and adults' brains in all kinds of negative ways. And I've listed quite a lot of uh, research papers there that you can just kind of cast your eyes over. But that, that high level of cortisol presents itself in so many different, manifests itself in so many different ways for children. You know, it can manifest itself in terms of aggression. It can manifest itself in terms of disconnection. It can manifest itself in poor health. And that obviously means absences and that obviously impacts on achievement. But I think the most pertinent one is that it manifests itself in depleting our verbal declarative memory. And our verbal declarative memory is the memory system that we rely on most in an exam so even if we subscribe to the the, the the side of education that believes that spelling forests is more important than being in them it's self-defeating to push children through a system of stress and to not deal with their root causes of stress if they're if if they're being brought into school but equally i think we also have to do pour this lens onto teachers as well because if teachers are living under high and persistent levels of stress and they are uh, many of them are then their empathy is depleted then their capacity to remember things and get things right can also be depleted so it's in the best interest of the entire system to be looking at stress and mental health as a key feature of what we should be doing and thinking about in terms to both get children achieving in school and being well uh, in themselves. So when I was thinking about planning curriculum and making curriculum, one of the key things or key uh, concepts I was thinking about was this idea of planning around a holistic um, view of education, a view of education that doesn't just attend to knowledge, that it's not just rich in knowledge, to use a term that Ofsted uses very frequently, but is also rich in humanity. 
And so when I broke that down, I thought of plaiting together, if you like, these five strands of curriculum thinking. And when I'm teaching, when I'm planning units of work, this is the these are the lenses I bring to bear on that in the hope that perhaps some of those issues I've just raised can be addressed. So the first one is coherence. And by coherence, I mean, this, how do things fit together for children? How do things make sense for children? We know that planning our what is it that we definitely want children to know and understand um, as we teach them and then we come to perhaps the three areas that that might connect um, outside of the classroom as well um, so I understand that that some of you are, are, have been losing sound and obviously I'll share these slides with you and, and hopefully pick up on some questions at the end if you have them I'm hoping it's back um but compassion for me is about not just putting children into a situation where they are developing empathy where they are being asked to develop compassion for me compassion is also about the curriculum being compassionate towards the children um if com if the curriculum is compassionate towards the children then you wouldn't get things like children being taken out of arts activities or sporting activities for extra intervention in english and maths because that's simply not compassionate if the curriculum is compassionate towards the teachers then if you're asking them to plan better more creative more holistic lessons you need to take something else away because we can't For me, Hi, sorry to interrupt. Your sound just keeps going now and again slightly, so we can't hear you for um, okay. a little bit, but, but then it comes back and it's absolutely fine. Um, how is it at the moment? It's okay right now, and um, it did just cut out, and um, but it does seem okay. I don't know if it's maybe your connection or something like that, but we'll, we'll carry on, see how it goes. And if okay. it's not a day, maybe we'll take a short break and, and see if we can get you some earphones or something. Okay, okay. okay. I, yeah, just, would it help if I disconnected my, the microphone and used the computer microphone? Should we try that? You can try that, yes. Yeah, I'll try that. I'll pull that out now. Is that any better? So I can hear you now. If we carry on like that and see how we go. Okay, all right, we'll try that. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what people have had and what they haven't, but I can repeat anything at the end if you have any questions. So I was just about to move on to creativity. Creativity for me is about connections. It's about taking something you, you know, you've experienced, and placing yourself in an unfamiliar context where you have to draw on your resourcefulness to, um, in order to solve the problem. And in order to be able to do that, we have to children in need of a dilemma, we have to get them grappling with problems, we have to get them trying to solve problems. Um, and then community. Community is about bringing down the walls between your school and the outside community for several reasons. One is to try and challenge this image of social mobility we have, whereby what we say to children is, this is what you're going to have to get out of the community, um, which then becomes self repeating because it's important those communities even more. 
And the other, the other problem that we sometimes have um, around community is that it's all about them going out, but it's also all about them going in. in. So we have these digital systems. What can we build? Apologies, Deborah. Not for off issues those communities. For, with your sound again. So, if everyone just waits here, we're just going to go through a very quick break um, just to see if we can get Deborah sorted and then we'll be back. So, if you just bear with us for a moment, just going to take a quick break. Okay. Hello everyone. I think we've tried to resolve this sound issue. Please let us know if there are still more issues. Uh, we think it might be a bandwidth thing. So I've switched my screen to low definition. Uh, and if it doesn't get any better, I'll switch my camera off as well. Um, I'm going to re-go through this slide if that's okay. And it might mean me running over slightly, but I know that many people were popping in the comments that they couldn't hear it, but I'll do it really quickly. Uh, and just to kind of summarize uh, this slide um what i was what what i was talking about was the idea that if i'm planning i come at it from these five points of view the coherence is how things hang together for children not just in terms of progression of skills and knowledge but in terms of how ideas connect together how the values of a school are congruent and coherent with the experience of a child in a school and i just gave the example that you haven't got a coherent curriculum if you're teaching for example sustainability and climate change and talking to the children about what needs to be altered in our day-to-day -day living and then doing that through 500 worksheets and laminated resources so it's making sure that there's congruence and coherence the credibility is the knowledge aspect so what is it we want children to know and what is it we want them to be able to experience? And I think that's something that most schools are pretty confident in delivering anyway, but we'll come into the how of that in a moment. And then the, the compassion, creativity and community, I think are, are vitally important in, in terms of children's experience um, of, of schooling. So compassion is not just about how we get children to feel compassionately towards others. I think schools tend to try to do that quite well but sometimes our schools are not acting compassionately towards children or towards the adults that work in them and that has to be a symbiotic relationship so sometimes for example we see children removed from arts and sports activities for extra interventions in maths and English when we know that arts and sports activities are really good for their mental health or we see teachers given more and more initiatives to put into their workload without anything being taken away so that they become overloaded. And as we just looked with the stress, saw with the stress slide, that's counterproductive. So how is our curriculum acting compassionately towards the children, for the children? And how is it developing compassion in the children? Creativity is about connections and connecting ideas. So taking your knowledge, your experience, the things that you um, are familiar with, and then dropping those into an unfamiliar context so that children have to wade through difficulty, wade through dilemma in order to use their creativity to find solutions to problems. And then community uh, for me is about bringing down the walls of a school so that effectively the communities interact and that we move away from this notion of social mobility being about preparing children for a future in which if they work hard and they're lucky they can get out of their communities because that's one of the reasons we have imploding uh, communities in many areas of our country and it also feeds into a narrative that children should feel ashamed of where they come from uh, and we really don't want that because that alienates children so how can we find those moments of pride with in the local community the the people who you know offer fantastic role models for children who are doing great stuff in their communities whether that's running a charity or a food bank or or whether it's you know having achieved something unusual how do we bring those people in and then of course it's also about all the experiences and the trips and the cultural capital that we can offer children and all five of them are important they're not just the other it's not just about the credibility with the others being add-ons as we see in lots of situations so 
one of the things that I've started talking about school, talking with about schools is this idea of an audience for children's work. Ron Berger's hierarchies of audience, he, in, in his book, Leaders of Their Own Learning, he talks about the idea that although teachers are very capable of giving children critique on their work, the motivation for put, producing work just for your teacher isn't very high in most children. And uh, it's a kind of motivation of diminishing rewards. So children get less keen on producing good work for their teacher the older they get and then the difficulty with the other audiences we bring into schools which tend to be parents or local school or the school community is that they're brought in as an applauding audience but not as a critical audience and so the children might get a sense of worth from what they've done but they're effectively being performative and everyone's supposed to just clap and applaud so what we need is something beyond that. And what Berger talks about is children being highly motivated when they're introduced to professionals who are capable of critiquing their work. And for me, you know, that, that can be something as simple as I'm teaching year two, we're doing the Great Fire of London, the children are redesigning a house for the baker and his family that was destroyed. And they've got to use all the new building regulations. So they've got to use their knowledge. They're coming up with creative solutions. But it's not me that's going to market, it's an architect. And if we bring in that person, then the children's knowledge increases because that architect knows no more than I do about the construction of buildings. But it also elevates the children's understanding that there are people out in the world with these jobs. Um, and then the final one is being of service to the world. And hopefully I'll be able to share with you some examples of how that might function for children. So I'm going to give you a practical example. And this practical example comes from a unit of work that I'd planned with a teacher who then was finding it really difficult to get into school because of COVID, their clinical vulnerabilities. And so I went in and offered to teach it for them. And what we had in that um, session with the children was a group of children who couldn't go outside so all our planning about getting outside and getting into the local area and going for walks and on trips and meeting people it had all imploded because we were practically under a local lockdown and they couldn't really go out they were, they were in school but they couldn't go out so we we did it this way i i just said to them if we were grown-ups who had a job to do that involved selling houses what do you think our job description might be and they came up with some very sensible suggestions like house sellers um so when we encountered estate agents they were a little bit flummoxed and we had to go into the meaning of that word and what does it mean and then if these grown-ups who have this job um, are to be trusted to go into people's houses with all their you know precious belongings and then trusted to sell them what kinds of personality might they have what kinds of qualities might they have what might they be good at and the children effectively created a job description of what a perfect estate agent would be they'd be good at being able to measure things they'd do accurate but positive descriptions of things they'd be honest and trustworthy and so on and so forth so uh, we've established effectively a code of conduct and a job description for what we're going to be asked to do. We come up with a name for our estate agency and then we encounter our first client. And our first client is Jenny from Australia and she emails the children. And I'm always honest with the children, this is a story. In our story, our estate agency is going to get an email. So are we ready? Well, let's say we're in our office this morning and we get an email. It's never a lie. The children are never being inducted into dishonesty. So I say to them in our story, we have this email. It's from Jenny. And it says this, uh, dear helpful house sellers, which is what they decided to call themselves, dear helpful house sellers, I need your help. My father was born in the house that he now has to leave. He has to go into a care home. He can no longer live there independently and he is heartbroken. I want you to go in there and to value the house and sell it to help to pay for his care. But I want you to understand that this house means an awful lot to him. And he is hoping that you will be trustworthy and kind. And so effectively, what the what the commission is doing is outlining to the children a set of expectations, not just around their job capabilities, their curriculum knowledge, but around their capacity for compassion.
And so the children, hopefully, at this stage, are pulled in a little bit effectively. They, they've got an emotional connection to the work. We can't go and see this house, which is in their local area, so we, we bring it up on the whiteboard and we all stand around it, scratching our heads and holding our chins and looking very much like we're sucking our teeth. <laughs> and, um, and the children are saying, well, it's a bit of a mess and somebody's thrown rubbish in the garden and, oh, it's going to be a hard sell, this one. And then other ones are saying, yeah, but it's beautiful. It's got big gardens and, look, it's got lots of, one child said it's got lots of period feet features uh, which was great because that's where one of the places we were going to go we gather our equipment what do we need if we're going to go and try and sell this house and then I tell the children we're standing in front of the front door um, and we stand in front of the front door and we do the whole dramatic of opening that front door and we've got all our equipment and one little boy says well I've got something else and I said what's that and he said I've got a ghost busting machine and my heart sinks because I don't want a ghost busting machine frankly don't want a ghost busting machine this is not going to be a unit of work about ghost stories um but I also know that I don't want him to become disattached you know disconnected from the work so I say you have have you what does it do and he said it, it busts ghosts and I said I know that but what does it actually do when it spots a ghost and he said it says beep 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 so I was like right okay so I'm holding that little bit of stress at the back of my mind and I'm narrating this you know moment where we're standing in this hallway with just most sparkling in the shafts of sunlight coming through the windows the parquet flooring the grand oak staircase that goes up not just in one direction but two directions because there are two wings in this house what a grand and beautiful hallway this is and I'm mid-flow when I hear a little beep, 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 beep from this boy. Is that your machine going off? Yes, he says. And my heart's sinking, but I'm smiling. I say to him, what is it it's seen? He said, it's seen a ghost. And I said, where? And he says, there. And he points in front of us. And I'm saying, there. And he said, yes. And I said, that white thing? He said, yes. I said, let me go ahead because I'm the boss of this company and I put myself in danger before you. So all the children are standing there, open mouthed, staring at me, taking two steps forward in the classroom, remember, putting out my hand and saying, oh, it's just a sheet and pulling it off. <gasps> Look at that grandfather clock. My goodness, I've never seen such a beautiful grandfather clock. And they're distracted and he might be a little bit disappointed, but he plays along with me. He knows that we've just had a little bit of a joke together. We've made a bit of a connection. Wasn't quite the way he wanted it to go, but he's with me. So the children and I explore the house. We look at what things look like in the past. We start looking at materials and objects and period features and cast iron fireplaces and oak wooden panelling and everything else. And the children start to um, do floor plans for the house. They start to uh, write descriptions uh, for our brochure for the house. And they're thinking about what a grand house like this would have in it. Some of the things, you know, you expect and some of the things they don't, you don't expect, like ghost busting machines. And one child said, there's a music room. And I said, oh, that sounds beautiful. What's in the music room? He said, there's a grand piano. It's covered in a sheet. He picks up on that. It's covered in a sheet, but there's also a glitter ball, he said, on the ceiling. And I'm not going to dispute that, but I'm going to keep it again in my pocket to think if I can come up with something later um, to connect them to this glitter ball. So we're ready to go upstairs. All of us, we've done our descriptive writing. We've done aerial floor pan plans of the building. We're, we're quite a way down the line now, but we're ready to go up the stairs. And unusually, what we find when we get to the top of the stairs and completely unexpectedly is a light coming from under the door. And immediately you can guess we get a little beep, beep 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 going off from one kid and I said well I'm not sure about that machine it didn't it wasn't accurate last time perhaps we'd better go and have a look and see what's behind the door we creep down the corridor we open the door and inside we find an old man I say to the children in the room sitting staring listlessly out of the window was an old man Around his feet, all over the floor, were photographs and documents, pieces of paper like litter. And on his bed was an open suitcase, empty, with a few pieces of clothing thrown over the bed. Shall I speak as the old man? I said. Yes, they said. And so I sat down in a chair and I said to them, I couldn't go. 
I couldn't even get down the stairs when the taxi came and rang the bell, but I hadn't even packed. How do you pack a hundred years of life into just a suitcase? And of course, what the children are going to do is learn about a hundred years of life. They're going to learn about their local history. They're going to learn about their local geography, but through the eyes of this old man. So we learn a lot about him. We even go back before he was born to his father, who was a patient at the field hospital, which just so happened to be their school, and how he met his his wife. And they had our old man, who weirdly the children are called Bob. Children always called old people, old men Bob. Um, we'd we we thought about how they'd met it linked us to the first world war it linked us to their local history of their school we thought about how bob had got an apprenticeship at camel Lad shipyard and how that apprenticeship had brought him into contact with some of the most famous ships in the world and how indeed he'd sailed away on one of those ships when world war ii broke out and sadly found himself being bombed by the japanese off the coast of singapore and the diary writing the empathy that, that led to was quite remarkable from some of the children i was able to weave in the glitter ball because he met his his wife martha at camel laird shipyard in the reception office and the two of them used to spend their weekends at Blackpool Ballroom dancing together. And when she got ill and could no longer go there, he installed a glitter ball in the music room and used to dance even when she was in her wheelchair to the music they loved. And the children are just buying into this fictional and non-fictional elements of human history so that they can create a memory box for Bob to take to his care home and learn all that history and geography as they go along. But we haven't yet got to the point. They've got lots of compassion. They've got lots of empathy for Bob. They've learned a lot of curriculum. So we've got the credibility. Uh, things are hanging together for them. They see how geography and history connect, how their maths and literacy can weave into their geography and history. But we haven't yet got the active compassion and the community, because what's the point in learning about lonely old people if you don't do something about lonely old people? Now, because of COVID, this photo is a stock photo, hasn't been able to happen in reality. We haven't had children being able to go into the homes or into the care homes of elderly people and give them hugs but we have been able to set up online communications the children have been able to write to those old people and hopefully one day those hugs will happen in person and so it's just one way of how the curriculum can be woven together in a way that gives children a sense of being of service in the here and now, a sense that they have value and purpose in the here and now, that they can get better at things, they can master things in the here and now and be trusted to make decisions that make the world a better place. And it seems to me that when children are given this agency, we have what I might think of as a pedagogy of power. So when we're thinking about this in this way, you'll see that I'm quite unashamedly drawing on stories. I've created the story of Bob. He's not a real person. He's a fictional person. And the reason that we're doing this is because we know that stories are psychologically privileged in the human mind. They act not just as neat distractions from any stresses and strains we have in our own lives they and triggers for empathy and all those other things that we know that stories do but they actually make curriculum content easier to understand so when we wrap curriculum content in a story what we're effectively doing is introducing children to the idea of characters who live complicated lives where things are not always as straightforward as they seem and yet there is a pattern to that there's a chronology there's a narrative structure because our brains like to be drawn to patterns and there are tensions driving those stories those characters are effectively effectively a human being in a mess and the children's job is to help the human being in a mess to be in less of a mess um, so effectively there's an agentive angle to unpicking the story and when we do that we use different kinds of thinking we use our somatic tools our bodies we're physically exploring the story the children are standing there with little torches they're creating still images of moments in Bob's timeline um, we're, we're thinking about about language and communication to create a story they're talking to Bob they're writing diary entries they're writing in role it's partly about escapism and transcendence which for many of the children that you'll work with is hugely important to just allow them moments of transcendence from the, the lives that they live 
And then there's the philosophical angles, the subtext, the wider meanings, the issues, you know, what can we do about elderly people and loneliness that perhaps distract us from our own problems and get us to focus on something somewhere else. So if we can use story, we can use it in two different ways. One of them is to use it as a backdrop. Um, this is the kind of version of story you'll see coming out of Ofsted's uh, reports and so on and so forth, where story has been a diversion, an enhancement, an indirect manifestation. It's been thrown in as an additional aspect of the learning. And that's OK. And it does have an impact on children's learning. I haven't got time to unpick this in detail, but effectively, the bars show how much better the story groups did than explanation groups in science tests for middle schools in the US. And the red bar shows how much better they did after three months so the story actually enhanced memory for a longer period of time that's just story being thrown in as an extra what I'm talking about is a kind of hitherland story where children are in it they're in it grappling with it solving it and and writing the endings effectively for themselves and what we do there then is that we pull together four areas of human learning and endeavor the heart the head the hand, the harmony, the affective dimension, the cognitive thinking processes, the doing, the active stuff, and the collaborative stuff. And when we can combine those things, we have something really agentive and powerful for children um, moving forward in their learning. And what we've learned or what we are learning in, in exploring this notion of story is that it can have quite a powerful effect on children's attitudes and behaviours. So, for example, um, this study, the Batman effect, which is a great name for a study, uh, started off by looking at children in early year settings and exploring how those children seem to be manifesting uh, attributes like persistence, um, setting goals and sticking to them, just working a bit harder and a bit longer on difficult tasks, and also kindness and consideration when they were wearing superhero costumes. And those and the, the difference between their behaviours without the costume and with the costume is quite marked. And then subsequent explorations of that have shown that with young children, the costume helps, but actually with older children, even just popping them in role, even putting them in the situation of a responsible adult can have quite a significant effect. And it's interesting, I think, to just look for a moment about what children say and what parents say when the curriculum changes. And this is just a small adaptation. The, 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 the feedback here that I'll, I will read out to you just in case you can't read the slide, but the feedback here came from a, a school improvement uh, inspector who had gone into a science department I was working with and all we'd done in science was take the content and drop it into contexts like how would you teach chemistry to children in a refugee camp who had no equipment um, how can we be accident investigators doing stress tests on metal to see whether or not this bridge collapse was the fault of the manufacturers the construction company or whether it was simply an accident. Just throwing them into these kinds of contexts has a deep impact on the children. So just look at this, the, the school improvement officer saying that not only are they grateful for what um, they've seen in science, but that one child has said um, that in the chemistry lessons, knowing that they were doing it for a purpose, uh, working with a charity who would work with refugees, uh, said, now our work is not just about remembering facts, who wants to do that? But there's a purpose to what we are doing. And this was a school that had, you know, struggled with behaviour in the science department and was finding those, those issues don't magically go away. Of course they don't. But was finding that by changing the purpose and the context of the learning, it was having an impact on children. In another school, in a primary school, a parent said this, my daughter spent the first three years at school feeling stupid, her word, and being told she was never going to reach a target. With the new curriculum, she comes home quoting facts and information, wanting to discuss topics in a way she's never done before. She's far more engaged, completely thrown as with a depth of knowledge and understanding of topics and issues. The curriculum has allowed her to progress and grow in a way she couldn't before. She's not afraid. And I, I love that, that she is not afraid because 
removing fear is a critical part of this work. It's not about expected levels of achievement, target grades. It's about we've got a problem that we need to solve here. So what do we need to know? What do we need to do in order to be able to solve Bob's problem, to solve this orangutan in a forest's problem, um, to solve this polar bear in the Arctic's problem? It's always about what do we need to do to solve a problem, not what do you need to do to meet your target? Because the targets become a byproduct of a really good education. No teacher goes into education wanting to make people feel stupid, but too often that's exactly what we end up doing. So when we're kind of working in this way, we're thinking about getting teachers to consider the lenses they bring to units of work. It's really common in schools to see topics thrown out. Like we're doing the Victorians, we're doing the medieval period, you know, in history, that kind of thing. But what exactly are we doing? We can't teach it all. We haven't got enough time. So you need a focus, you need a lens. And in this example, the lens we chose to look at was the the issue of a young boy being sold to a master chimney sweep in order to um, save his family. And this was a common practice, obviously, in, in Victorian times when families were really struggling to survive. Too often, as we're seeing in Afghanistan right now, they were forced to sell their children. So what we're looking at here is the story through the eyes of little George Brewster. George Brewster was the last chimney sweep in Britain to die up a chimney. And it's a tragic tale, but effectively what our class did was to create a protest group protesting outside the House of, Par House of Parliament after his death, as really happened in Victorian times, to campaign for a change in the law. And we got that change in the law and the kids were really, really pleased about it and they wanted to talk to the chimney sweep, the master sweep who'd bought him and sent him up that chimney in the first place. And so I said I'd speak to them as the master sweep, I'll speak as him. And they're shouting at me, you know, they're, they're kind of quite angry and they're saying, we've changed the law now and you'll never be able to send those boys up chimneys again and you're a bad man and I hope you've learned your lesson and all those kinds of things. And I just said to them, stop. You're right, you've changed the law, good for you, bully for you, I'll have to go out and I'll have to buy some brushes instead and use this newfangled technology that's been invented so I don't send children up there. And in the meantime, there are now thousands of children out in the streets and I'm not going to be feeding them, none of my colleagues are going to be feeding them, we're not going to be putting a roof over their heads, some winter's coming. So are they going to starve out there? Are they going to freeze to death out there? Because I'll tell you what, they're your problem now. And of course, the children are halted in their tracks because we've pivoted the situation and put them into a place where they have to practice responsibility for their actions and face the consequences of their actions. Now, of course, then we can become a philanthropic organisation. We can think about charity in Victorian times. We can learn all kinds of things about those Victorian times. But effectively, what we're doing is getting children to deal with the idea that sometimes issues are quite complex. I haven't got time to go through all the examples that I'd been hoping to share with you just because we were a little bit slowed down earlier. But in another project in secondary school where we worked together with English history and science, what we found was that when we, when we worked in this way, we found that children were elevating their language, Batman effect again, they wanted to sound like adults. They were changing their behaviours. I remember teaching an English class, we were in a PR agency and they were aid agency workers trying to come up with solutions for the problems of waterborne diseases in Haiti. And when they came to English, they were coming to a PR company to train in communications. When they went to maths, they were at the Office of National Statistics to train in data handling so they could communicate the dangers of waterborne diseases more readily. And obviously in science, they were learning about waterborne diseases and they were going to the Centre for Disease Control. What I noticed in my lesson, my English lesson, was that they started to manage each other's behaviour. Oi, stop messing around. We're Skyping the UN in half an hour. You best crack on. That's child to child, not adult to child behaviour. They were invested, they wanted to stay after, uh, stay at lunch times, come back after school, they said we can't just do this as a story, we're going to set up a charity and they raised about £3,000. Their performance in school, in tests, improved and they just had better attitudes to school. So there's no, there wasn't a cost to that work, there were only, as far as we could see, benefits to that work. We're working within, I've talked about the effective cognitive 
um, you know, dimensions of learning and then also those kinds of embodied and social aspects of learning. Bruna simplifies that into getting us to think about making sure children get the opportunity to communicate in three ways, through drawing, through graphic representation, the iconic, through symbolic, through talk um, and reading, and then the enacted through doing. And all we're trying to do in, in our lessons is to think about getting children working within those three modes, because it allows them a much broader access to ranges of communication to be able to demonstrate not just their learning but also their emotions and then we can take that work into the community we can take that work and elevate it so at the moment there are about 85 schools across the northwest of England working with Chester Zoo on conservation and sustainability and they've been working with them for about five years now and in effect what what each school does in the summer term is just dedicate their time to conservation and each year group from early years right through to year nine chooses a different focus that they're going to look at and their partner organization is Chester Zoo so we see for example here in year two they're looking at palm oil they're exploring the impact that deforestation for palm oil has and how it finds its ways into the products that we use reception class here um, are writing things like stop deforestation save the tigers in sumatra and if you think about our curriculum expectations they're only supposed to be able to write words as cvc combinations and then we've got children being able to to do this because they're bothered basically they're bothered about the learning they're holding adults to account, writing letters to MPs, writing letters to organisations, to local politicians as well, but also getting their parents to make pledges, writing a pledge on a pledge tree and then coming back into school six months later and having to write on the other side of that pledge what they've actually done uh, is holding them to account rather than just being surface. The quality of their work is just outstanding. It's absolutely beautiful across lots of different subjects. I mean, look at Chloe's drawing of an orangutan baby there and uh, she's only in year five um, and look at the quality of it and and so there's no compromise on the work that they do but they put so much time into that work because they're completely invested and what we have here is this the the outcomes for those children because in addition to passing their sats They've persuaded businesses to change their behaviours. They've planted wildflower meadows. They've planted woods and practically a forest across the region now. They've raised thousands of pounds. They campaigned with Chester Zoo to make Chester the world's first sustainable palm oil city in the world. They even got the CEO of Iceland in to school and lectured him about his ban on palm oil and said it should be sustainable palm oil. And he changed his business as policy and they've passed their SATs. So I think we've got to get to the point where we understand that a great education has tests as a byproduct, not the end product. And if we can get our heads around that, then we can create something that's really positive for children. This was the slogan that those children came up with, our future, our fight. And I think we've got to take it to our hearts as educators and get that congruence, that, that coherence in our curriculum so that they know that we know that they can make a difference. And when we do that, I think we have an education, education system worthy of the name education. So thank you so much. I know I've gone a little bit over time there and I hope that's okay. Um, we do have a panel discussion in five minutes, but if any of you do have any questions and you want to drop them in the chat box, I'm more than happy to um, have a look at them. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm seeing, I'm seeing all these lovely little hands coming up and hearts and I'm not sure if I should carry on speaking or not. So I'll just be quiet for now. <laughs> 